Good morning. Good to see you. We've been talking about the subject of creation and how did this stuff get here. And uh, there is some thought that science has explained away the need for the existence of God. And we talked about the fact that Hawkins says, given the, the force of gravity, we can make this creation ourselves. In other words, give me the point of singularity in that huge, massive explosion. And once that gets underway, the force of gravity, we can take it from there. And then we talked about the joke where God said to the scientists, what do you mean? Make your own dirt. And so here we see that rather than explaining God away, it reinforces the probability that this stuff could not come together uh, easily. Last, last uh, couple of weeks, we've been looking at a uh, uh, case for the real Christ with uh, Bob, help me. And uh, I was going to say that. That was right on my lips, Lee Strobel. <clears throat> Uh, this week, uh, uh, there's a biologist, which is not my field at all, uh, Ray Bolin, and uh, he has goes lecturing. Uh, he's been at 25, 30 universities, and uh, he talks about the fact that as he begins to study uh, the field of biology, it firmly reaffirms the fact that this is God, and his fingers are all over this thing. And so uh, I'm going to steal uh, <coughs> freely from Ray, good friend of mine. When we finish this, We need to have a quiet, unshakable confidence in God. If you go to India today, you'll see that Thomas has left his fingerprint all over India. And, uh, but Thomas took a journey where he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> he rose again. Uh, sure, sure. <coughs> When I stick my finger in the handprints, they drove the nails in, I put my fist in aside. Then I'll know that he rose again. It is not good, we said last week, to have a blind faith in God. If you don't know that you know that you know that you know. The interesting thing is that each disciple knew. They had seen. John said, this is we've handled, we've touched, we've talked to. Peter said, this is firsthand knowledge. Each of the disciples died alone and would not say it was not true. They died saying, I'm sorry, I saw him. If that gets me killed, there's nothing I can do about it. I saw him. These type of fingerprints that God has left behind are the ones where you can say, I know that I know that I know that I know God is real. And that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. I know this. And the odd place we're going to find it is in His creation. Remember, we started off with Romans chapter 1. And uh, if you look behind me, uh, it will be on that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I almost did, I almost did this, and then I could hear my mother. <laughs> David! Got it. <laughs> Bless her heart. She also makes me say ing instead of in. So now, <laughs> in Romans, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to all who believe, to the Jew and to the Greek. And then where does he go from this? He's not ashamed of God, but then he says, he goes to creation. And he says, the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all godliness godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He's saying that even in the first century, people would suppress the obvious and not accept what they were looking at. And then he goes on, since what may be known about God is plain to them, why is it plain to them? 
because God has made it plain to them. And so God has said, let me explain it. Look at this. And uh, <coughs> there's some truth about God that is obviously there. It is intuitive. Men and women know it. But they won't accept what is plain, according to Paul. And God has gone to great lengths to make it plain. For since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen and have been understood by what has been made and men are without, people are without excuse. People are. I would excuse. He says, if you look around, you're going to see God all over the place, so much so that come to the conclusion there is no God is absurd. The psalmist says, only a fool would say in his heart there is no God. So let's look at what are these signs that Paul says God has left behind. What, what are all this stuff that's so obvious that if you don't accept design, you have to uh, subvert. You have to uh, suppress that. You have to uh, ignore the obvious. Uh, now, my, 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 Linda and I have these discussions. <laughs> Linda's up in Canada right now with her mom, uh, and uh, they are having record cold weather. Uh, she flew in, drove to the house, and has not left since <laughs> she <laughs> sits in a chair with a blanket on. Uh, anything below 80 degrees, and she's got a sweater on. Bless her heart. All right. So when I get to talk to her, uh, <clears throat> she, 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 she's ready to come home. All right. <laughs> I think it's me, not the weather. We'll see. Uh, <clears throat> How do we? <laughs> oh, you guys love me, don't you? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. All right. Um, <clears throat> so when we look at this, we're going to be pointing out things that are plain, and uh, you can go duh. But we have to go, duh, of course, I knew my God was real all the time. And that he had left enough. Uh, uh, Lyle, you told me this morning the name of uh, the two comedians. Oh, John? John did? Penn and Taller. Teller? Penn and Taller. They said to Penn, if you were to get to say God, like you don't believe there is a God, what would you say to him? And he would say, why didn't you make it more obvious? But God is saying, I did. What are you looking at? Yeah. And so here is the evidence that God has left for us. <laughs> now, <coughs> we're looking at something called intelligent design. Intelligent design is not a theological uh, perspective where... Uh, creationists start from uh, Genesis 1, 1 to 11. Intelligent design is God said that if we looked at nature, we would find God. So where is the fingerprint of God in nature? And uh, what uh, would show to us that God did this? And so that would speak of intelligent design. In other words... Uh, over and over again, you will hear these scientists say, this is magnificent. It almost looks like someone designed this. <laughs> I'm actually going to give you a few of those quotes, but I'm talking about suppressed. Duh, it's obvious. And uh, how is it that we help -ulate? We help, can help from seeing the obvious. Now that's called helpulate. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at if this was created by random events and evolved over time without design, what are the probabilities of this happening without God intervening? Now, <clears throat> some things cannot be the result of natural process. Let me illustrate this 
uh, for those of you who are going through the uh, uh, class on Wednesday night with me, listen to that CD that uh, you took home. And Andy Stanley illustrates this a totally different way, uh, but it will reinforce what we're talking about now. Here is how you intuitively are wired to see intelligent design. Not only did God put intelligent design into everything and say, it's obvious I left the breadcrumbs all over the place, just follow the trail. He created you with an innate sense to identify intelligent design. And what do I mean by that? Your next door neighbor has been buying lottery tickets for decades. Every week he buys a ticket, never wins. But it doesn't bother. He just buys a ticket every week. He's a Calvinist. You only need one ticket. If it's God's will, you're going to win it. So he buys one ticket. <laughs> what did the Calvinist say when he fell down the stairs? I'm glad that's over. All right. Now, we're not a theologically astute group, are we? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I need a uh, coffee. The, here's how you intuitively know something has intelligent design behind it. Week after week, but one week he wins it. That's not odd. The gambling commission's not going to look, nobody cares. Everybody's excited, you're excited. Maybe he's got... $4 million, you know, it starts at four and goes up and up and up to 190 or whatever. And you're excited for him. You know, you're a good friend. Maybe he'll drop a 10 spot on your doorstep because you're such friends. And, and who knows? Then he wins it the next week. And then he wins it the next week. And then he wins it. The next week, now the chances of winning, they used to be one in 25 million. They changed it so the pots would get bigger. So how do you know the probability of that is? He wins it five weeks in a row. What are you saying in your head? He fixed it. This has got intelligent design. Somebody engineered this outcome. It didn't happen randomly. Now you look at a lottery ticket and you say, duh. But we are going to be looking at things a lot more complex than winning lottery ticket five times in a row. <laughs> the way you come to the odds are it's 1 in 25 million times 1 in 25 million plus 1 in 25 million, which if you follow it out is something in the neighborhood of several sextillion, whatever that is, but it's big. It just, and you're looking at, and you just, that can't happen. Okay? That can't happen. Everybody intuitively knows that can't happen. And yet, what did we say yesterday? Some of this stuff, like the law of gravity and the uh, exact uh, energy that is provided for the earth to expand and all of these things, this has to be within a billionth of a billionth of a billionth. This has to be within a trillionth of a quadrillion. This has to be. You multiply all of those together, and what do you say? Evolution. <laughs> Random. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. This happened. Some things can't happen. I mean, over and over again, what did we say last week? The probability of protein design was 1 to the 40th power. <coughs> okay, how do we know that didn't happen randomly? Because there's only 1 to the 8th power atoms in the entire universe. You don't have enough raw material to do that. Now, you see what I'm saying? Suppressed, obvious knowledge. How come it is that you can suppress something that is intuitively obvious as that. Well, it actually is quite easy, and I'm going to tell you in a minute. We've said that you can obviously see intelligent design. Here's a bunch of rocks. <laughs> and uh, when we look at these rocks, we can tell that they're kind of obvious. His dad just told him he's got to climb up there, okay? <laughs> Would you say that's random or intelligent design? Random, of course. You're wired to know. Next one? Is that random or intelligent design? It is random, except that maybe here, see that stack right there? That it's 
iffy. It could happen. <laughs> in other words, all of this stuff we're talking about is possible. One in quadrillion, zillion, trillion, quad, whatever times. It could happen. It looks like a little bit of variance. Is that, what is it, random? Yeah, because of the shape and the striations on the rock. There's a glacier came, and the rock is actually from hundreds of miles away, and the glacier took it there, dumped it, and left. So, yeah, natural causes. Next. <sighs> now, is that random, or is that, did somebody think that through? High probability of thinking it through, but it could be random. But probably thought through. This one? You have to suppress the obvious in order to not see God. You can calculate the odds of this happening by random selection without a purpose. In other words, not only do these things have to evolve, they have to evolve with no purpose. The problem with that is the law of science is entropy. What is entropy? That's what your teenage bedroom looks like after a month and you haven't been on them to clean it up. That's entropy. <coughs> Everything deteriorates in order, and yet the universe stays hugely in order. It, the universe is going backwards. It should not be doing this. And so Paul says, look, guys, it is so obvious that somebody designed this that they are without excuse. Now, <coughs> Here is Francis Crick. How can they come to the conclusion that this is random? Francis Crick, who is the uh, co-founder of the DNA uh, uh, thing along with uh, Francis Collins, and uh, <laughs> he was saying that when you look at these structures, this is a Nobel Prize winner, and you <laughs> look at them and you're trying to figure out how did this get here, Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. This protein evolved. Nobody, this protein evolved. It looks like it was designed. No, this protein evolved. The dogma is you have to keep saying it evolved. Mount Rushmore evolved. You have to look at it, and you, science dogma says you have to look at Mount Rushmore, and you have to say, no, this evolved. No, this evolved. No, this evolved. That is how you can come up against such stupendous odds, that word, stupendous odds, and still hold to the fact that it was a random chance, not design, that did it. This is evolution. This is not design. You have to keep repeating that if you are a bi biologist uh, in affecting this. <laughs> the other thing is, one of them has to do with, we are wired to recognize design. You can tell from patterns right away whether it just happened or whether it had design. It's wired right in you. <laughs> now, another, this, these are all popular illustrations. I'm not saying anything new. Another thing that it speaks about intelligent design is if you have a system, Giglio did this, and I'm not going to show you his video, but there are others. Uh, look him up, and he will <coughs> talk about the flagellum uh, 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 virus. And he's talking about a complete system where if any part is missing, you can't have the whole thing. In other words, I got my favorite mouse trap here, and <coughs> it has... One, two, three, four, four, four metal parts. And if any part is missing, you don't catch fewer mice, you don't catch any mice. Everything has to be there, and it can't evolve or it has no purpose. Uh, so that is uh, <coughs> one of the signs that this thing that we are looking at uh, came about all at once. In other words, this mouse trap was put together, now it's a mousetrap. When it's a board, it's a board. <coughs> when it's a board without a spring, it's a board without a spring. When it's a board without a trigger, it doesn't do anything. Uh, <coughs> in fact, I've used these, <laughs> not many of them do anything. But anyways, <laughs> uh, 
So you can see the whole thing needs to be there. And uh, uh, Mike Be uh, Behe, who was looking at, he's a biologist, and he didn't keep saying, this is evolved, this is evolved, this is evolved. He broke a rule of biology, and he says, oh my, this looks like somebody designed it, which is a violation of the rule of biology. All right. <laughs> now, the bacterial flagellum uh, is a very complex uh, machine. And uh, it actually, here's a little uh, diagram of it. And these are some of the parts that go into this. And it spins about 1,000 RPM, that kind of stuff, or a lot faster, sorry. And these are all the parts of this bacteria. And uh, uh, that whip rotates. It's got stators. Where do you find a stator, David? Electric motor. And it has all of the parts. Uh, an armature, it has all of the, it has bushing, it has everything in an electric motor built there. In other words, if parts of it aren't there, it doesn't work at all. Now, I'm going to talk a little more about that, but uh, it operates the same way as an outboard motor, as an electric motor does, with all of the same 40 parts. So this is one of those illustrations which doesn't have five parts, a board and four metal. It has four parts, 40 parts, and they all have to work together. So here it is. Let's just look at this video. Or not. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, spectacular technologies revolutionized scientific understanding of the cell, the basic unit of life. During an interview with biochemist Michael Behe, Strobel learned how this new knowledge has shaken the foundations of Darwin's theory. In the 19th century, when Darwin was alive, uh, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. But with the hard work of science in the 20th century, we've seen that the, the cell is far from simple. It's, it's got very complicated molecular machines and things that are very resistant to Darwinian explanation. Michael Behe has devoted his career to the study of the design and operation of the cell. He has also written extensively on the biochemical challenge to evolution. Most people have no idea of how, how small and complex cells are. A typical cell from you or me, called a eukaryotic cell, is probably a tenth of the size of the head of a pin. And yet, in that single cell, there are about three billion units of DNA making out the chromosomes. And those three billion units make the molecular machines of the cell, literally machines that make the cell work. With computer animation, we can enter the cell. Here, the staggering complexity of its molecular machinery is clearly seen. It's like going into a, an automobile factory. The factory has a large number of machines. The parts have to fit together in very specific ways to do their jobs. And if things go wrong, the cell is in big trouble. And just one cell is enormously complex. But humans, you and I, are made from trillions of cells. And those trillions of cells have to fit together in the right way and do their own job. Darwinism was a lot more plausible when we were thinking about globs of protoplasm than it is when we're thinking about molecular machines. Each of these biochemical machines is a masterpiece of engineering and nanotechnology. They are essential to functions as vital and diverse as vision, photosynthesis, and the production of energy in the cell. Michael Behe has studied several of these machines, including the flagellum, a remarkable rotary motor. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor. And I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. 
Behe's reaction was not surprising, especially when the bacterial flagellar motor is animated and magnified more than 50,000 times to display the details of its construction and operation. And Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them have, are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. It's got some tail proteins which act as the propeller. When the flagellum rotates, these push against the water and therefore push the bacterium forward. And the motor uses a flow of acid from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell to power the turning. The bacterial flagellum has two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force. It has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller. It's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. In all, about 40 different protein parts are required to build a flagellar motor. Half of them are constructor proteins, specialized mechanisms that assemble the flagellum's individual components. Since its discovery, biologists have tried to understand how a machine of such superb design could have arisen gradually kind of without foresight or plan. And uh, the, the first part was easy. Now they're going to tell you how it constructs itself. Then it gets complicated. <laughs> the problem with all of this is the criticism is that there are things in, and uh, deadly uh, <coughs> bacteria uh, pathogenic bacterias which are similar, uh, therefore it probably evolved up. It actually probably evolved down to fewer parts because with the mousetrap I can stick it in a bag, all of the parts, it just won't put itself together. You have to put it together, in other words, and with these 40 proteins, the problem with proteins is they don't get along. They're like siblings, and they don't like to be near each other. You touched me, did not. Now you have to get 40 proteins that align themselves and get along in the proper order in order to make that machine. Uh, so <coughs> when you say there are pathogenic bacteria that are similar, good for you. Now, <coughs> uh, I want to look at uh, when people look at that, they have to say, remember this evolved, remember this evolved, remember, you cannot say this was designed, you ha remember this evolved. And uh, uh, Behe, uh, who's a bit of a ostracized because he suggested you can't make life without some interference. It either came from off planet or an external system. You can't come up with life on its own in this uh, circumstances we call Earth. I love this scientist. Listen to this. <laughs> Since the flagellum is so well designed and beautifully constructed by an ordered assembly pathway, even I, who am not a creationist, get an awe-inspiring feeling when I see its divine beauty. <laughs> it's not designed. It's created. It's not created. It's evolved. Remember, Paul says they have to suppress the truth. God said, I put it all over the place. To not see God, you have to say, I'm not going to come to the obvious confusion. All right, let's uh, skip down. And uh, I wanted to look at DNA. I know you're just dying to hear that. <clears throat> but how do scientists uh, look at this without... Uh, coming to the conclusion that God did it. <laughs> you know who Carl Sagan is? Carl Sagan, yeah, did those older movies and stuff. This is a, a book review on something that he wrote, and this is uh, an evolutionary uh, biologist, and he's writing, uh, Sagan is an evolutionary biologist. In other words, this evolved, this evolved, this is not designed, this evolved. And uh, he wrote a book called A uh, Damon Haunted World. And this is what the critique says. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for the unsubstantiated and just so, because we have a prior commitment 
a commitment to materialism, it's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of a phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our prior adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying and uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absurd. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Paul says they suppressed obvious knowledge. And we talked about the fact, how do you design in a material world a way to look at after-death experiences? The material world says everything's flat, nothing's moving, brain's dead. Now, how do you design an experience when you don't believe there's anything but the material and all the material's dead? In other words, he's saying you can't even design an investigation to investigate what you're looking at if you stay within the material parameters. And God is saying, of course not. I did that, and I'm not material. And so you have to suppress that knowledge. This is not about science. <clears throat> this is God saying, you don't have excuse for not looking up at the sky and seeing my fingerprint all over this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was nothing made that was made. John says, I saw the Creator of the universe. God says, look at the sky. Look at the cell. Look at anything you want, and you will see my work. Only a fool would say in his heart, there is no God. When I finally figured out there was a God, the next step for me was I better get to know him, Amen. or this is not going to end well. I didn't automatically come to faith in Jesus Christ, <coughs> I, because... I'm a bit cynical. I had to explore different avenues. Finally, the, the proofs of Jesus Christ and the fact that he was proved to be the Son of God by coming to life again becomes irrefutable. And if you look at the explanations for if he didn't do that, what did he do? The swoon theory, the uh, dogs ate him theory, all of that stuff. Suddenly you're saying, this is absurd. I have to not obviously come to the conclusion that is intuitive for what I'm looking at. I have to suppress this in order to not believe Jesus was the Son of God. There's that much evidence there. There's that much evidence there. And so then I said... I have to get to know this Jesus. And that was my journey. It was a long one. It scared the daylights out of my father, who was a pastor. <laughs> I was so confused, sometimes I self-medicated. It was the 60s, come on. <laughs> but in the end, but in the end, even an unregenerate mind saw God and gave his life to Jesus Christ. And you can trust him with your life. He can design this. And he can design your life plan. In fact, he already has. Before you were born, he had your life plan. And we can come to him and say, Lord, let's walk this out together. He's got something good in mind for you. He really does. The guy who designed the flagellum that runs at 100,000 RPM. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel going that fast too, but... He has a plan for your life. Would you stand with me? In order for you to not come to the conclusion that there's a God, Paul says you have to suppress the obvious facts. 
Obviously, there's a God. Now what are you going to do? Well, I come to church. No, this God's a creative, awesome God. (coughs) This God has a plan for the universe. This God keeps everything within billions of trillions of tolerances. This guy keeps a billion trillion tolerances within a billionth of a trillionth of a tolerance. And he does it all at once. And he says, would you let me guide your life? I left my footprints all over the sand. I've been here. I have proven I'm capable. Will you not only give your life to me through Jesus Christ, but will you follow me? That's all Jesus said. Come, follow me. I have a plan for your life. And it doesn't matter how bad it is where you are now, because when Jesus says, I have a plan for you, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, a plan to give you hope in the future, they were in captivity. They got took and spread all through the country, had to learn a new language, new culture, new thing. He says, hey, I got good stuff coming. It doesn't matter if you're in the pits now. He's got a good plan for your life. Don't look at where you are. Look at where God's going to take you. Amen? Amen? Our Heavenly Father, the wisest thing that we can do is to look at the obvious and reach up and take your hand and walk out the rest of our life with you as our Lord and Savior. We look at the obvious and we say, yep, there you are. And we are open to you coming in to take control of our life. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the obvious trail of your being here first that we can see. We trust you to keep the universe running tomorrow morning and to see the sun come up in the east and go down in the west. We trust you to make the tides happen on schedule We trust you to keep the earth spinning exactly at the right RPMs, at the right tilt and the right angle. We trust you to hold us onto this spinning ball with just enough gravity to keep us from flying off or flatten us with its power. We trust you with the right mix of oxygen so that we get up and suck that first breath of air. The fog lifts from our mind We sharpen up, and there you are all along, watching over us all night. You are our God and our Savior, and we just love walking out with you. Now lead us, guide us, and as we're quiet before you, direct our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There is a God.
Sadie, were you saying that you're also interested in uh, continuing on in worship? Is that one of the things you were saying on Facebook? The other yes. thing is I'm ignoring, but just, uh, was that the one thing? Yes. No? It was. What'd you say? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, because you're faithful, year after year, people out of here enter the ministry, go into worship leading, go on to university, and come back in to serve the church. Isn't that exciting? It has been worth it everything we have done. <clears throat> Over the next year, we're going to have to hire a staff of 10, just the ones that have left in the last few years. Let's stand up and give God the praise for his goodness. Now, if you're a guest with us, we'd love to have you. Pastor's Luncheon is right after the second service. Come on over. There's directions to the place. And also, next week is that important religious holiday called Super Bowl. The youth are having pizzas here for you to take home and cook so that uh, they can do it as a fundraiser. So if you'd like to have fresh, homemade pizzeria pizza, just fill out the card and get that from them. God is so good. All the time. Yeah, he is. All the time. He's just great. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm just astounded at the numbers, the, the fact that you guide trillions of stars, and the fact that you, you do things within a billion trillions and and Lord, that's just amazing to me. Father, how dare we, though, when we come to you and pray <laughs> that we tell you how big all our problems are. Father, help us to, to understand and tell our problems how big our God is. Mm. That we serve you and nothing shall stand against us. Father, we ask you to receive these tithes. <laughs> you killed it. <laughs> May the Holy Spirit of God, who created everything you see, come to life and power inside your very being. In Jesus' name, amen.